great. Thanks, Donna. So um, you are Donna Rogers. We're Donna Prime. That's right. Yeah. And it's the um, 23rd of February, uh, 2022. So thanks ever so much for um, doing this interview for uh, the Lionesses, Women in Rugby League. Um, can I just start by asking you um, to just talk about a bit about where and when you were born, how you got into Rugby League and what age you started playing? Okay, yeah. Um, I was born in Hull in 1978, um, which is quite some time ago now. And I started playing rugby league at the age of 13, I believe. My sister at the time was doing a sports um, qualification at one of the colleges and her and a friend had decided to, to see this advertisement for a, women, a, a girls rugby league team actually that had started and she came home and told me and I was like, oh, actually, I quite fancy that um, and went along with her and, and that was it. I never looked back. I absolutely loved it. Um, I've always quite like, I used to do karate and things like that. So I quite like that kind of physical high impact um, type sport. So yeah, I just joined um, the whole Vixens girls team at the time at the age of 13. And as I say, I went back, absolutely loved it and never looked back. And did 12, your sister? 13 years. My sister, did you... uh, she didn't play for quite as long as me. Um, and yeah, so, but yeah, it was my sister that had kind of encouraged me to go along in the first place. Um, were you a rugby league family? Did you did you watch rugby league? We were we are a rugby league family. My family support Hull FC, and I never used to go to many matches. My family didn't have a great deal of money, so it was quite a, a cost for things like that. But I've got a family who, who are there at every single match, like really strong fans. And actually, we have some family that are Hull KR fans as well. So yeah, we I was more familiar with rugby league than I ever was with rugby union, and I still. I still don't really get rugby union now in terms of never been around it and, and watched that. But yeah, I don't watch it so much now, but yeah. Um, and what, um, so what was it like playing, um, playing at that age? And how did you, could you, could you talk me through kind of um, the, your time at Hull Vixens and then how that led up into playing for um, GB? Um, I actually, was part of two teams. I've joined all Vixens initially as a girls team. And for me, I'm quite a sporty person and, and naturally flourish within a sporting environment. And I don't mean that in a bigoted, bigoted headed way, but I just naturally pick up sport quite quickly. So I did loads of sports from being really young and I, and I coached like a karate from a young age and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as I did the training, I, I picked it up, I think quite well. And I actually joined, so I played for the girls team, but I actually got invited to play for the women's team at quite a young age as well. So I'd only been playing for the girls team, I think a year or so before I was invited to then play for the women's team. And I used to just love it. I used to love the adrenaline rush. I used to love the physicality of the, the sport, the speed, the how exhausted you was at the end of it. Um, and just the team aspect, and I was, I'm quite introverted. Um, I've, I've developed that over the years, but when I was at 13 years old, I was very introverted, very shy, um, and probably quite awkward if you ask some of my people I played it back then. And actually rugby really brought me out of my shell, and it was the one place that I was at my most confident was on that rugby field. Um, and it was like I was a different character. I just came alive, um, and the energy, and I have asthma. And I used, to, I always remember some games thinking, I don't even know I've survived this match. I, having to bring my asthma spray on several times through the game. But I just loved it. I loved tackling. I, I was quite good at tackling and I, I wasn't fearful of getting in there and, and getting stuck in and, and being involved in that kind of aspect. And I also liked, um, I was a captain for a couple of years. I, I won several awards in terms of players, player, um, the, the different awards that you get on a year, annual basis. I didn't win them every year. So I was captain through. Um, after a few years, and I'm not I'm not familiar with time frames. Um, Vixens, a, a couple of members moved from Vixens to form a team called Hull Dockers Women's Team, and I was East Yorkshire based, and Vixens were based in like North um, North Hull, um, Cottenham kind of area. Mm -hmm. So it just made sense. Hull Dockers was on my doorstep, so I kind of and and. I kind of followed the coach and, and Anne Thompson at the time and, and went and joined that team. Um, and I just progressed. I continued to play where I could help out. I would. I played for Yorkshire as well. And then I think at the age of 17, I went for trials for Great Britain at the time. And I was selected. I can't remember the, the, the time period. I selected for the training squad. And I think it was under coach, is it Ian Harris? Or Ian Harrison? Something like that. So I was under him as the training squad. But I didn't get selected to tour Australia at the time based on age 
uh, and in all honesty at the time I was gutted but now I think back actually I wouldn't have been ready mature mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been mm -hmm. mature enough and mm -hmm. brave enough to go out on my own at 17 18 to Australia with a, a group of women that I didn't really know that well so I definitely think that was the right decision but it still led me into that taste for for that international status and that position and it was all for me about being proud of my performance and and being driven and wanting to do be the best I can in terms of that standard of of performance and play I guess um I did like some of the recognition that you got off fam family and friends and within Hull I was I was recognized from some local teams in terms of um supporting some men I used to I had a cousin who played rugby I used to go help coach his rugby team he was a little bit younger than me so he used to go help coach them and things like that so yeah I've been yeah I just loved everything about it yeah that's amazing just, just yeah. alive so I don't know if that's enough oh yeah um, do you, I mean, do you, um, I mean do you, so were you still at school at this point so when did you leave school yes yeah, I, I was at school when I started playing rugby yeah um and then I left school at 15 and 16 went to college um and then I didn't do university because I wasn't mm -hmm. having dis I wasn't I didn't feel academic so I kind of did vocational training and then progressed that way in terms of my career so and yeah I did playing it playing all that time when you were yeah. studying yeah and I actually went and did beauty therapy funny enough and I remember there being an article in the whole Daily Mail around when I'd been selected for the Great Britain training squad. Uh, we've got this beauty therapy rugby playing oh, girl. And I always remember going, turning up to my lectures at Hull College with bruises on my neck and things like that. And, and people saying, what on earth is going on? This isn't like a typical beauty therapy, like stigma that uh, how you should look. I was like, oh, no, but... It Breaking the stereotypes. Yeah. And it it was the I, I actually wanted to do sports massage. So I wanted to get into a kind of a sports career. So I'd looked at media initially and I didn't like that at all. So then I went to do the massage shadow, but I did the beauty and I love that. And I've, I've got a sports massage qualification and things as well through all wow. that. Wow. Um so did playing take up a lot of your time at this point? It used to take up it didn't in a degree because I think with any club you train, I think we used to train twice a week, a mm -hmm. couple of hours on a night, um, and then a Sunday, your Sunday would be gone, or most of it, depending if you were playing, if, away, if you were away, then that was worse. Yeah. And then occasionally it would be a weekend if you were playing in Barrow, Barrow on Furness, somewhere like that, where you've got, to, <laughs> you can't get there and back in a day. And so we used to stay over. Um, and yeah. so it, it wasn't a massive, when it, became more Yorkshire and Great Britain then it was substantially more training because you had all of the elitist training to go along that in terms of the gym aspect the muscular um toning and building and, and all of that type of stuff so yeah that became a little bit more difficult yeah uh, and more time consuming alongside a job and or a higher education or whatever that was yeah was, definitely um yeah. and so how did um yeah can you tell me about so um you didn't get into the squad to tour for the so that would be the late 1990s, wouldn't it? So then, I think it could... maybe one of the first or the second tour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, so can you tell me about when you got your when the, the next time, kind of when you did get your call yeah. up? Have you? So I think I can't remember 100 percent what happened between the first one. I can't remember if it was I, I tried for the the tour because I. I think some of them is four years and then I think there's been shorter mm -hmm. periods been, it's been in Australia or in Great Britain or yeah. England as it's now called isn't it um so but again I went for trial outs and, and the coach at the time was Jackie Sheldon and I got through into the training squad and then I was selected for the 2002 tour um and I was just absolutely elated um and I think because I'd been disappointed previously we're not getting the tour it was just a, a very it was just a different kind of feeling and I guess the emotional um, achievement attached with that and the the excitement and everything. And then I think I got a bit fearful of terms of, oh my goodness, what does this actually mean? I've now got to go. I've never been abroad. I've never been on an aeroplane. My first aeroplane flight was to Australia. Um, so it was just like <laughs> on top of on top of that, there was also the personal aspect in terms of my own growth and, and confidence and and being able to have relationships with women from different clubs and different towns mm -hmm. that yes I'd only met on a rugby field or had a little conversation with that Yorkshire level or after a game so it was it was then a different challenge because it, it's become more than just a, a rugby game as such yeah. where you go and play you go 
home at the end of the day and you're spending a full month of your life um, in Australia with this group of ladies and obviously before that you're training with them so you're building up your rapport and your relationship which was, which was really useful but yeah Jackie Sheldon was amazing um, we had a really good squad absolutely loved it um, and, I, and I actually after the 2002 tour I was selected again for the, the, the tour after that and I actually had to drop out because I was really starting to struggle with back problems um, oh, and so I had to withdraw okay. for personal health reasons yeah and I was oh. gutted because I never really wanted to, but I just had to make the decision that, and I still struggle with neck and back now, actually, I have to make the decision that if I go play at this level, what's going to be the impact on that physically? Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so what, was, um, what was it like when you, um, when you got to Australia? What was, you know, what did it consist of in terms of how many games you played and, um, and, the, and how you played and, and what you felt? Um, yeah now that's uh, how many games do we, I can't remember the tour was Sydney Brisbane and Canberra I remember mm-hmm. that so we did the three locations I think we had three test matches and then we had um almost like training matches in between those with local teams to kind of keep our skill and stamina and everything up I always remember going we were given very strict instructions about things like hydration and keeping well and healthy and we had to take echinacea tablets and vitamin c and drink certain amounts of water every day and we'd be measured weight wise before and after a match to see how much hydration we need to keep on top of wow. to keep us healthy because obviously it's a very different climate um in, and weather than what we're used to in in england um so I just always remember them and we stayed in i think it was a formula one motel the first time which was was that Brisbane? No, I can't, I can't even remember which one it was. Maybe City. That was on the outskirts. Uh, and that we played a match just opposite the road from that. So we had to walk from our hotel across the road wow. and just to, to the game. And uh, yeah, it was. So I think for me personally, I, I played predominantly winger. They were looking at me at one point to move in, into potentially the hooker position. Um, but I played more winger. My role within my local teams was standoff or halfbacks type mm-hmm. positions or loose forward. Um, so yeah, winger centre type positions. And I just always remember like I'd played in front of at stadiums and in front of a crowds before because we'd had the opportunity to, at Yorkshire and and other teams certainly like cup matches to play at some of the men's stadiums. So that was always quite rewarding, I think, mm-hmm. and, and seeing that. But crowd out there was just totally different it was bigger it was noisier it was a group of Engl- British women in an Aus- Australian crowd so we were getting held abuse and all sorts at us from the sidelines <laughs> but it was just it just it wasn't fearful it was just kind of part of that experience and yeah it was just really good really good so much really bigger good. crowds than you would have got at home do you think I think so in certain aspects yeah definitely and I think I think we I can't remember whether we won or not. We, we didn't win the series in 2002. Mm-hmm. We won one of the three test matches. I think we won all of the, the interim matches, the training matches. I remember going out and training and, and, and I think the first week, the, because the ground was just rock hard, it was so tough and, and not necessarily covered in grass in places where we're training. And I, I think at mm-hmm. one point at my legs were just covered in absolute grazes from where my shorts ended and where my socks began, both legs covered bruises, grazes. And I think most of us was like that. Um, and I, yeah, when you're putting your, your rugby kit on and the feeling of that Great Britain shirt coming over your back and standing there singing the national anthem was just absolutely amazing. It was such an emotional, um, mixed emotional feeling because it's that proud, but then I'm representing my country. Um, but then such a shame because in the, in, in the opposite side of that we didn't have much family and friends out there with us because obviously it was such a substantial cost um, and we had to raise quite a lot of money ourselves individually to get there as wow, well. Like I, how... I think it was a thousand pound we all oh. had to raise each. How did you do that? Of, um, through no no it's fine um, through sponsorship through um, running at, like quiz nights and things like that um it was really hard really tough challenge because you're asking the same people over and over again we'd go i do like knock on doors of companies to see if they could donate raffle prizes local shops and things like that i got sponsored off a local chinese 
um company but it was it was like a hundred pound or something like that 50 pound 100 pound and um, so just lots of little things and actually I was really fortunate because my family as I said earlier didn't have a lot of money my mum's disabled so didn't work my dad was her carer so couldn't work and there was four of us so we didn't have a, a substantial amount of money and I was really fortunate that a friend was able to help me out in order so that I didn't miss out on that place financially um, and, and a debt that I'll always kind of appreciating her yeah oh my gosh that's amazing and how um how did that feel in terms of like you know looking at the men presumably they weren't um did they have to they they weren't paying for their own I would have thought so and it and it's funny because I thought that when we're out there and I, I, mean, I always remember thinking and having conversations with people like what do the men actually do because the women had to raise substantial funds and mm. that was that was £1,000 per, what, 30, 22 to 30 of us, um, plus all of the additional costs for kit and everything. We all, it all had to come from grants or funding or sponsorship or whatever. And the, the Great British team and, and the, the people, the coaches, the people working in the background did all of that for us, a massive amount of work. That goes un, unseen, so it's great that we have the we're recognizing the women who played the game but then there's also the recognition for those that actually made it happen because without those doing that it, we would never have got to Australia yeah. we'd never have done those tours and it is disappointing and actually when we were in Australia our great British men were also out there but they wouldn't meet us they wouldn't we we never got the opportunity to meet them um, and I always remember being really disappointed by that because I just thought that really shows the difference between the men and the women game and yeah. whether it was egotistical or whether it was just they, they wanted them to focus on their gameplay, not be distracted or whatever the reasons I'm sure yeah. it's plausible. It's just such a shame when you're looking yeah. at two teams representing Great Britain in the same mm. spot and we couldn't even come together for a meeting just to say hi. And it's yeah. just sad. Yeah. It's really sad. yeah. Hopefully that's not the case now. Because no. actually on a local in a local level, that definitely wasn't the situation. Um, and that not what I experienced from the male team locally. And I'm really I'm, yeah, in terms of whole FC and OK were often quite supportive of the women's game. Um oh and that's really positive. You, yeah, yes. And it wasn't like I, I knew some of the male the male players um personally and, and built relationships so if you saw them on a night out they were always interested to ask how you were getting on and how the game was going and what you were doing and things like that so yeah it was just a shame that at that national level it wasn't reciprocated mm, mm, yeah well this is part of um you know the you know uh julia's thing really about um you know getting people like jackie recognized and stuff because it is it's amazing what yeah. you know what's gone on and and the experiences yeah, that amazing. people have had um can i ask you what your mom and dad and you and your siblings thought about and felt about you going to australia and you know playing yeah. for gb as you can imagine they were super proud and still are and i've still got family members now that aunties and uncles that i don't see very regularly when i do they're always saying oh this was our rugby player she played for great britain and still like sing and dance around it and, and just love it and, uh, and have that proudness for it and it's a shame that i'm not in the game anymore and i'm out of it because i do miss it but yeah they were immensely proud i think i mean i don't know this for certain but i, I imagine my mum and dad fell fell concerned in terms of what that would mean they, they wanted me to go they wanted me to do it they were immensely proud of me they saw how I loved it and how I thrived and how I came alive and that field they, they come and watch when they could it was difficult for my mum being in a wheelchair because she she couldn't get to many games and things like that but I guess from a financial perspective the the pressure for them potentially on how could they support me to get there and I guess I don't know they've never said that but I do wonder and being a parent now how that must feel must have felt back then when I had to I had to borrow money off a friend to be able to go because my job didn't pay enough and my family couldn't support mm. it um and obviously that's just but yeah but in terms of it, when we lost the when we lost in Australia and we lost the last game so we didn't win the the test match it was my mum that I rang it was my mum that I wanted to hear it was her voice I wanted to say mum we've lost and I, I remember just I just remember it was in one of the stadiums on one of the pay phones in the stadiums. I was like, got a shower, got changed, did the thing. I said, I need to go with my mum. Um, and I just cried my eyes on the phone. And I just always remember thinking I was absolutely gutted, but it was her voice that I wanted to hear in terms of that comfort and support. And she was amazing in terms of being supportive. And it's OK, you've still got the achievement. You've all done such an amazing job. And um, doesn't matter what the end result was. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was lovely. 
yeah all, all things that mums are good at aren't they that, that yeah, like that's yeah. exactly right isn't it that one thing here you yeah. are boys oh that's lovely it's so lovely, what yeah. was it what was it like on tour with the with the other women that you know that you're getting to know and that you ended up you know spending a month of your life with what was that like it was it was really good um it probably helped me personally mass massively in terms of that social um dialogue I think the group was lovely we I think we all got on fairly well to be fair we were often grouped um in terms of our accommodation and I was I was grouped with some really lovely girls and people who were for me it was challenging because being an introvert around predominantly extroverted people um and I am quite I was quite shy back then so I, I didn't necessarily put a voice forward or things like that it might be slightly different now but but some of the group were quite quite engaging like the captain and vice captain so I think it was Brenda Dorbeck and Lisa Macintosh or Mackin yeah Lisa Mack yeah. um but we just got on so well and even when we did social activities we all just came together we had a laugh um we supported each other we shared kind of resources we had yeah similar opinions but where we disagreed things we dealt with quite well we used to do team building activities and things like that as well as the training and watching the videos of the opposition and, and mapping out how you're going to attack the game and watch your game play and all that type of stuff so yeah it was really interesting very dynamic very diverse um and I think from as you like I say in there in terms of a personal perspective when you when you in an environment with people of such different personalities that's a challenge on its own isn't it and you're then having to adapt and evolve and respond to those personalities with while still being respectful and and um being able to put your own self and not get lost in that so yeah it was yeah. quite good so um, yeah. so when you came home was there any um was there any fanfare was there any um kind of recognition of what, what you what you'd achieved and where you've been and things I think from my local club there was but I don't think there was not, I don't even have a medal or a trophy or anything like that yeah. for it um, I don't even have many pictures. I've got my the team picture, and I've got the the, the long ones that you get done on the oh, video. I've got that. Um, but in terms of yeah, I can't I can't remember so much about yeah. it. So I think you had the local people saying, "Oh, how was it?" and asking you and your family and and like your cl local club. But beyond that, maybe it's an article in the, the newspaper. I think that was it. Mm -hmm. It's then kind of forgotten and moved on. Um, so yeah, it's a bit bit bizarre yeah so did you then um go back to playing <clears throat> uh for Hull so you carried carried on I think I did for a little bit and then I can't I can't remember in terms of the time frames how long because after playing for 12 years so what was that 13 for 12 years um 25 26 is that yeah that's when I then stopped playing 20 and then I stopped playing altogether um, did you for um, physical reasons yeah. physical but also um practical reasons because I met my husband who is my husband now and he was he I met him in Hull but he was from Red Cow which is where I live now and he wanted to come home after a couple of years so I moved up north with him and there just isn't women's rugby league ground here um so it's literally a Yorkshire thing and that's it which is such a shame as well and I did try there was a it was a women's team in Peter Lee as part of the, the men's rugby union squad. So I went along there for a couple of training sessions, but it was like I was having to travel 45 minutes, 50 minutes to get to a training session. And I just thought it's just not practical. And then yeah. physically, I, my, my back problems started again. So, yeah. So I played for 12, 13 years. I think I had one year out in that process. Right. Um, and, it, and, I, and, I and I don't know if there's some... I don't watch rugby league massively now on TV and I don't know if it's because it's that internal thing of I miss it so much and I yeah. haven't necessarily like moved on from that because I do think as athletes at whatever level you work at when you quit it's a massive part of your life gone and it, you have to learn how to be a different person a different individual in terms of behaviorally who you are and for me as I said earlier my confidence and I, I came alive on that on that rugby field when I did sports um, and I don't have sports in my life now so it's it's I've had to really learn how to be a different person and and thrive without sport I guess without it yeah that's really yeah. interesting yeah yeah I mean, it's such a massive part of your life and then mm -hmm. yeah to stop that um yeah. what do you think kind of um was your uh 
the best bit about playing and the best bit about playing for playing for your country or, or but just playing in general? I loved the for, considering I was introverted, I loved the team aspect. I love coming together as a team. I love engaging, working with people and doing something collective and being part of a bigger picture, being part of something, not just for me. So I, I loved that aspect mm-hmm. of it, but I loved the adrenaline rush. I loved, absolutely loved tackling. I loved coming off the field and someone saying, oh my God, I was a top ta- top tackle, top tackler, top tackle count, whatever it was for so many games, if not most of the games wow. at times. Not everyone, because we had other people who were, who were very good tacklers as well. And I just used to love coming off and getting that recognition and that appreciation in terms of my own motivation and drive. And I couldn't walk for a week. Some games I couldn't walk for a week. Oh, I don't even God. know how I got out of bed. Some mornings I'll get, you couldn't physically couldn't get in and out of the car. Uh, <laughs> like oh, to be <laughs> lifted out um, and and not recovering from one match to the next physically still got bruises on top of bruises and things like that. And I always remember like in Australia, cause I didn't bruise easy back then. And this is really silly. And I was saying about the graces and stuff, but it was like, we used to, some of you used to say, Oh, what bruises have we got to say? Cause we didn't bruise easy. So if we, if we'd got a massive bruise, we knew we'd had a tough, hard game. <laughs> and it was just yeah. like little things like that. that we used to have a conversation about, Oh, what bruises have you got? Um, yeah. And it was just, I think personally it helped me grow, it helped me gain confidence, it helped me develop socially. Um, the stuff, the skills that I can use now within my job as a, as a learning development manager and I, and I link back and certainly the importance of the sports psychology and how your thinking impacts on your performance and all of that type of stuff. And I mm. use that, a lot of that within my work and, and doing coaching and things. Um, and I used a, a quote quite often, which I didn't get within the Great Britain squad as such, but I've got in my career. I probably have had it in the Great Britain squad, but not necessarily remembered it. But that psychological um, sports psychology, I remember doing work with a sports psychologist with the Great Britain squad, um, is that performance equals potential minus interference from Timothy Galloway. Um, oh. in, a game of, in, a, in a game of tennis, I think he writes about sports coach and stuff like that. So, and I use that all the time in my personal development work because it is fundamentally and I use myself as on a rugby field if I was stood there so your your performance is you're able to perform but if your internal programs and thinking is stopping you that you then it's going to have an impact so your interference and I use I use myself in terms of if I stand on a rugby field and I'm waiting for the ball to be kicked at the kickoff and I'm stood there saying to myself mentally internally please don't kick it to me please don't kick it to me please don't kick to me. The reality is I'm going to drop that ball. Yes, Whereas okay. if you change your wow. thinking and your mindset and it's positive, the reality is that's not going to be an issue. And it really doesn't, does kind of bring that sport psychology alive. Wow. Um, and the importance of thinking and your internal meta programs and stuff like that. God, that's really interesting. And I, and I think I, I remember, so, so someone said, I think it was maybe Julia said about, um, about Ian and Jackie and the way they coach was quite, um, uh forward thinking for the time because I don't think you know talking about that when you were talking about the um um the muscle the work and things you were doing and it's like I think um and kind of about what you eat and what you you know mm-hmm. your hydration and stuff and I you know I don't think that came into football until a little bit after you know into kind of elite football until mm-hmm. that and and so as part of the project Ian has um uh donated his like um uh, I'm not sure from what tour it is, but uh, like all his notes from what he did with the oh, training and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, just copious amounts of notes of about what people, you know, should be doing. And, and it's just like, that's yeah. a really, you know, great uh, kind of just really forward looking and things yeah, you take for granted now, but that were quite, um, you know, not necessarily unheard of, but not being practiced so much. And that whole yeah. mentality thing that you've just described is really... Mm-hmm fascinating and yeah, there is something about isn't there um professional sports people you don't you don't get far without that kind of really good psychology because you won't yeah. you won't get to play for Great Britain if you don't you know kind of have that and that's yeah that's amazing um is, yeah um what I think um, you're right. sorry sorry no go on I was gonna say I think you're right because my local coach Anne Thompson and, and she's done a lot of she's been a coach for absolute years and been fundamentally in women's rugby but also she does a lot with men's rugby as well um and whole KR and other teams and she was very similar very forward thinking in the not just in it's the mat it's the way you play it the the physicality with the training the 
really supportive, so definitely, because, and I think as a, as an athlete, some of this stuff is taken for granted because it's inherent. It's, mm. it's in our internal makeup. Like, mm. I remember having a conversation with somebody and talking about certain aspects of my personality and it was, I'm determined, I'm hardworking, I'm, I'm driven, I'm motivated and all those things which, which strive fundamentally through sport. Yeah. Um, and that competitive, having that competitive kind of mindset, but not in an aggressive or a nasty way, but in a way that you that helps improve your performance to make you strive and do your best yeah. is is fundamental. And I, and I always remember we did mindfulness, we did like sports psychology, all of those types of things, because it is, if your mind's not in the right place, you're never going to be at your top performance. And yeah. Your top ability. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating, really fascinating. Yeah. And um, what would you say is the most um, challenging aspect of your of your rugby playing career, and and particularly of um, playing for your country, if there is I one? I think the challenging, uh, some challenging aspects for me was physically getting there. I didn't mm-hmm. drive at the time, so I had to rely on other people to get me there. So that was quite a challenge. Mm. The financial aspect of of it was challenging but I guess from a personal perspective it was just that the social aspect of it whilst I I did it and I was able to do it it, I still had it's I lacked confidence I was nervous or scared to go into that so going to Australia I was I had massive emotions because I was buzzing and so proud that I'd got in the squad but I was so nervous and scared of what was to come and being in the away from home for four months four weeks um, with a group of people that I didn't know inside out so so that was a bit of a challenge but then equally that's helped me grow and develop and I, 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 and my role in learning development you can see how some of that kind of plays because I, I do believe that there's an opportunity for learning in nearly every opportunity or mm. every situation we're in there's potential for learning mm. and, I've, and I've taken that from my experience within rugby and, and used that to my advantage um but yeah I think they were the, the main I having a having I think some of the other challenges are the physical challenges if you get injured um the recovery of that the cost associated with that again because at, at elite level and great britain level you've got access to physios and things but yeah. at a local level your access to physios is somewhat limited so then you've got the cost and stuff like that so yeah that then can impact on your performance and, and long-term health because if you're not getting the right care and you're not taking on the right treatment and all those types of things that can really have a, an adverse impact and reaction and I think probably most sports people feel that later in life at yeah. some point yeah, yeah. definitely definitely yeah. putting yeah what you put your body through yeah for an yeah. intense amount of time <clears throat> were you disappointed um to not be able to do the uh, the tour after the 2002 one yeah. at the time were you yeah it was such a hard decision yeah and I remember being quite emotionally upset about it but it wasn't a light decision it was such a complex decision Mm. in terms of for me personally and I and I it's it wasn't about being famous or anything like that but I loved that being part of something bigger as I mentioned earlier and I think stepping away from that and then what what would that mean and then obviously my rugby career kind of come to an end not long after that anyway um and I just always remember writing a letter to Jackie to explain my decision and why I was pulling out. And I just was struggling. I was struggling physically um, to recover from what it was getting worse, the recovery from one game to another. Um, and I, and for me personally, I'm not the type of person that would go out and do something half-heartedly. Yeah. So if you're not fully fit to do the game, I wouldn't want to go on that field and represent my country if I wasn't in a place to do that. And that's yeah. that's how I came to the decision in the end. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um that's yeah, that's amazing. Um what do you think um what what are your reflections on what you've achieved? You know, I'm sat here listening to this and just thinking, oh my God, like, you know, what what have I ever done? You know, like listening to you, it's like it's amazing. And I think <clears throat> I wonder whether um yeah, I wonder whether you know that I wonder what you know and, and it's like you know you're just you know you're a, a, you're a mom and you've got two children and you've got a job and you go into Eureka and all that and it's like but you know and that's all amazing and then you've just got this other enormous thing that you've done and it's like you kind of, how do you feel about that it's strange because I think I think it does get forget forgotten because it was so long ago now <clears throat> um years out I can't even wear the years out but 
I do, and I do bring it up and like, I use it as an interesting fact at work and stuff like that if it comes up in conversation. And as I say, I relate to it in work and I'm able to use it. So I can I can benefit from it that way and I can mm-hmm. share. So at the minute, I've got my, my little boy going to Rugrats Rugby. Um, mm. Now, I don't know if he'll ever be able to play. He's a bit, he's a bit more fearful. My daughter, on the other hand, she thinks that she can join in now and she obviously can and she goes and gets that rugby ball and runs around and all of us like, she's just like you. Um, <laughs> so but the shame, the, the, the sadness that we have up here is there just isn't that that same level of access to rugby league. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I probably do forget about it t- at times. I know it's there. I love talking about it. I love seeing that women's rugby is now on the tv that saddens me to a degree in that we never had that same kind of exposure and I would have loved to have played on that stage and I get that that recognition on that stage as well so Mm -hmm. that not even just for us but so for the for the broader community for what that means for everybody and so that our families and our friends and also could have experienced and gone through that with us because as I said earlier that was one of the positives we were in Australia but one of the downsides was we didn't Mm -hmm. have our friends and families supporting us um, and they couldn't watch us on TV and things like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we were waiting for phone calls or whatever to kind of update on our progression and things like that. So yeah. I think that's yeah. one of the real aspects of, of that that technical stage and being able to perform there. But I've forgotten what you, the question was. I've <coughs> well, just, a, <laughs> yeah, um, just about reflecting on what you'd achieved, yeah. actually. But that's I think that's really interesting what you just said there, because I think that's right that, you know, you must look at, kind of sit to see where it's come now um and sad that you didn't get to experience it that but actually the only reason those women are experiencing that is because of what you and everyone else has done and that is massive I think it is yeah definitely influential and I think you can see over the years as it's progressed we would we would have articles and things like that in the newspaper or we might go on a I think there was a a tv document documentary years and years ago that followed the whole vixens around and we were part of that so Mm -hmm. the stuff like that that happened um that we were involved with but at least it's now raising the profile even yeah. more. So it's it's just been a, a gradual process. And I think that's true of any women's sport, isn't it? Unfortunately, it's it's just taken time yeah. to kind of get through. To, um, yeah. But in terms of my reflections, yeah, I think I've definitely grown from it, from a social, from a confidential, from a confidence perspective. I can use aspects of it in my role. I'm not a trained psychologist, but I get aspects of that when I'm doing mm. personality profiling and, and helping people to develop. Um and I can bring some of those skills to my family life and my, how I operate mm-hmm. and, and bringing my children up in terms of their qualities and, and values mm-hmm. and beliefs and things as well. And mm-hmm. Without being too strict, but I'm trying not to be too much of a rugby coach, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> when he's out there, he won't hit the tap and he won't join in because he's fearful of the game, bless him. Like, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> But that's, I mean, and, and when you think about, and I know that they're, they're, they're still young now, but kind of particularly. George in kind of a couple of years time would really understand you know start to understand what is his mom you know it's like if if you're watching that on telly it's like I did that and I went to Australia and I you know that's 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 amazing really um and what I suppose just to finish which we have which we we have discussed but kind of the future of women's rugby league what what would you like to see and and how yeah how do you think it's how do you think it's it's going and I suppose thinking about the world cup which should have been last year but will be this year have you got any thoughts yeah. about that I guess I'm not I'm not in it anymore so it's a bit difficult to know what's really going on and but I think I would like to see women's rugby league treated in exactly the same regard as men's rugby league I don't think it should be differentiated anyway just because mm-hmm. you're, you're of a certain gender one way or the other um and that's regardless of who you are and which team you play for um, and I think I'd like to see a broader, a, a broader covering of rugby league as opposed to just being Yorkshire. And I know that is getting a little bit bigger in areas, but I guess it's subject to funding and teams and stuff like that, isn't it? Mm. But yeah, I think the biggest thing would be continue to raise the profile, continue to raise the the media attention, getting women's um, rugby on the TV a little bit more. Mm. And is it given the same? prevalence is that the right word in terms of is it on the same channels does it have the same mm. importance in terms of the, mm. the air in time and those types of things because those are some of the real gender parity issues aren't they mm. um and 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 I guess it's great putting it on tv but do people then want to watch it and it's how you how do you address that mm. because I think some of this stuff is inherent to a lot of people and that's where I think it's a shame 
Um, so yeah, I think if you can, if the profile can raise and change for that, and I, and I guess ten years down the line, twenty years down the line, I think it'll be. It's a shame it can't move faster. It's a shame yeah. it has to take such a long time for things yeah. to evolve and to grow because of the humanistic side of things, which is yeah. our stereotype biases. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think <clears throat> the like, kind of thinking about um, uh, kind of the fact that this is that um, part of this project, you know, is about getting people recognised with their caps and things. It's like that shouldn't have to be a fight. There's no doubt, you know, that that shouldn't have to be <clears throat> an issue. But I suppose, yeah, the positive side of that um, is looking at, at the World Cup and thinking that for the first time in any sport, the men's, the women's and the wheelchair all paid for the same amount of money <clears throat> and on the same stadiums and hopefully given the same uh, coverage on the telly. I think that's built into the right. And it's like, if that happens, that's great. You know, that's yeah, yeah. just, you know, kind of fingers crossed and, and that people can then, yeah, just start to see everything as, you know, a bit more equal. And, and but I think in um, places like Castleford and, Wakefield I think that you know particularly the girls game it's just massive and it's really growing and I just you really kind of hope that that um that that takes off and that you know can people can follow in your footsteps and things and uh and you know it's 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 amazing kind of what you've just described and stuff and like you know how young you were and experiencing those things and stuff it's it's amazing yeah yeah Yeah. there's something to be proud of definitely I'm very naive like I genuinely didn't know what I was going into yeah but I never look back I, yeah. I was just thinking about it, so yeah. I and that's um, it and to, to start when you're kind of 12 13 and it's like it, but it, but like you say obviously a, a natural propensity towards being good at sport so it sounds like you could have just taken up anything and been really good at it and it's like but it sounds like that rugby league suited you in terms of the physical nature yeah. of it yeah. yeah 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 oh that's amazing have you have you got anything else that you'd like to share or talk um, about i don't think so i was trying to rack my brain over th- like trying to remember things and stuff like that um i d- yeah I, d- I don't know how mindsets and things can be changed because i when we were on the 2002 tour i said to you about we weren't allowed to meet the great britain squad but we did meet the brisbane broncos and i think that shows then the yeah. difference in thinking and and i understand that they weren't performing at a elite level lot that in terms of international level so the pressures were different for that for the Brisbane Broncos compared to the Great Britain men I understand that and I understand there's some probably motives around that but that for me just shows how different the mindset of one group is over the other because they were quite happy they took us to a bar they socialized with us that they like really welcomed us into that group we got to meet players like um Dan Lockyer and, and people like that which was just amazing yeah um, yeah and I think if, if that because I think in terms of the equality, it's got to be integrated more, hasn't it, in terms mm. of, and I don't know if it is, as I say, I, I'm not involved in it. There isn't women's rugby league around here in terms of where I'm based. But men and women have got to come together more in order to break those barriers. Now, we, we used to play quite a lot of touch rugby games with our men's club. Mm-hmm. We used to train together and stuff like that. And I do think that type of thing helps because it's showing, it's breaking down perceptions yeah. fundamentally, isn't it, about... yeah. The only difference really is that physical, natural physical difference. Yeah. In that absolutely some men are physically stronger than women. Actually, yeah. some women are physically stronger than men. Yeah. And what we definitely. Against one woman in Australia that we actually questioned is is this whether it was right or not to do this. I hope this won't go in the interview, but in terms of the evidence, but we actually questioned that person because they just was massive compared to us as a group of women and they're yeah. so much stronger so it is and I think yeah if anything more can be done around that and bringing women and men together more in terms of the rugby league not just at the performance stage of the game it's yeah. a bit beforehand but yeah, yeah. that's just me that's just but my, I, I think and, and possibly because I'm uh, uh, you know quite aware of it at the moment from various things I think that is happening and I think um uh the you know the super league male teams you know they've obviously I think most of them have got a, a women's team that and you know not quite it's obviously not 
on par necessarily but there's definitely big strides towards it and I feel like the crowds are getting bigger at the women's yeah, and you know everyone can see and you know because it's rugby league and I so it's funny, Julia and I have kind of different perceptions of this, I think, because obviously she's been in the game for so long and has seen these struggles and has seen kind of, mm -hmm. you know, obviously she was very pioneering and all that. And as an yeah. outsider, <clears throat> but I've spent kind of the last six years or something in rugby league, I always think of rugby league as quite um, a sport based historically on equality, kind of from where it, you know, where mm -hmm. the origins of the sport and that just quite a lot more advanced than other main sports um mm -hmm. but i think then that's just because that's from what i see but because i'm not experiencing yeah. it but i'm really hoping yeah. that it's going in the in the right direction but actually when yeah. you're talking it made me think you should start a um you should start a girls uh rugby league up in in t9 yeah. up in red car because yeah. you know it's got so actually there's a heritage project going on at the moment in newcastle looking at the history of rugby league in the area um because you know there's you know there's a lot of student rugby league played in newcastle and things yeah. and a few you know gateshead and what have you and uh and that and that's really good and obviously you know that isn't just Yorkshire and Lancashire but it's up you know it's up there and um but yeah oh I feel like that I mean I realize you've got quite a lot on but yes start yeah. that as well. <laughs> start in a few that. years yeah exactly. but it is because that's what one of the things I was going to say is fundamentally for women's rugby to continue you've got to have the likes of those Julia Lees and Ian yeah. Harrison's and Jackie yeah. Sheldon's and Anne Thompson's you've, you've got to still have those people and I guess if those if the women that that played back then I don't know how many of us became coaches or mm. became, so I used to do club secretary and things like that, and I used to at the time, but since I've came out of it, I've done nothing with it, mm. um, because locally there isn't anything there, and, it, and there is an element of that, isn't there? How, yeah. how do you, because you're relying on people driving it, yeah. um, and it's yeah. who that, who's there, because, it, it, and I th it's interesting that you say about you and Julie having different perspective, because how does women's rugby leave compare to women's rugby union, yeah. in terms of that yeah. platform? Because yeah. I often, I, I don't know if women's rugby union is bigger yeah. than I, I, women's rugby league, but then I think, is men's rugby union bigger than, I don't know. Yeah, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's, it, it's a really good point. It's different, isn't it? And it's different, yeah. different audiences. And, and if you're not across both, you don't necessarily know it. But from my perspective or my perception of it is that women's rugby league is, big, is bigger than women's rugby union. Yeah. Um, and certainly more equal I think um yeah, which I, I I think so but I I don't know it is just a perception yeah. but I think this idea that's been really running through the world cup narrative in the last few years that men's women's wheelchair it's all the same I think is amazing and I think that's yeah, kind yeah. of that's really something to us for other sports to aspire to um and I you know when kind of when my family are looking at buying tickets for the World Cup, you know, not being massive rugby league fans, um, but recognizing that it's a big sporting mm -hmm. event, in, you know, near us. So yeah. why wouldn't we go? Just as equally looking for the women in the wheelchair than they are the men. So that there is, I don't yeah. think there's any kind of idea that you would only look for the men's. And you know, hopefully, so therefore that's you know, yeah, changing hopefully. And I do think rugby league, regardless of whether it's back in the eighties, I do think the benefit of rugby league is that community. It, it's not just the rugby community, but the wider community. Yeah. It does bring communities together. And if you look at the comparison to rugby league and, and football, yeah. you don't get the same hostility at, at rugby league. Yeah. You used to do football. You can have two. You can have two members of a family supporting different teams that conflict at a derby, but they go support the team, but have a laugh and come together yeah. and, and whatnot. And it is just. And I don't yeah. know if that's. I don't want to sound um, fearful of any equality or whatever myself but I don't know if that's inherent of the Yorkshire traits and characteristics of the people and the personalities within because it is predominantly came from Yorkshire hasn't it yeah um but I do think that's where it, it where it thrives is because we have that feel of community yeah. from it and Definitely. And I was thinking when you were talking about um, when you were playing for Hull Vixens and that, uh, you know, people recognising you and people, were, you know, asking how it was going and stuff. I mean, it is a sport fundamentally in those communities, in those small towns and cities of Yorkshire, Lancashire. And, I, you know, I think. I th yeah, it is its biggest selling point, I think, for me, that it is, that it belongs to those to those to those people in those places and you're exactly right you don't you don't even have to like the sport to know that rugby league is a massive part of your community yeah. and to um you know and and I think so so my side 
hustle is I, I do a, a PhD in um, I'm looking at how engaging in sporting heritage projects is good for social inclusion. So there's lots of, you know, kind of heritage lottery funded um, projects across Yorkshire and Lancashire that are that are run by the rugby club, um, run by the, found, the, the charity of the rugby club, really, that are engaging either older people with dementia looking at, um, you know, kind of uh, memories of you know Wigan in the yeah. 60s or whatever or engaging young people in kind of theatre projects but based on you know Rochdale Hornets or whatever and it's like the impact of it is massive and it's like there's you know these these particularly in this Rochdale one it's like you know four or five teenagers who were really into drama um, from Rochdale not massive rugby league fans but they really understood that rugby league was massive to their community and it's like yeah. you know what they got out of engaging this in this project with old players old Rochdale players who are now in their 70s and 80s you know it's like it's massive and it's like you don't get that in other sports it's really it's really yeah, yeah. specific to rugby league and I think mm -hmm. it's something to be really proud about I think being yeah. part of that rugby league community yeah and I must admit that's one thing I do miss is I miss because I don't live in Hull anymore yeah I don't walk down the street and see people from that community that would ask yeah. me I do miss an element of that definitely yeah and when I first moved it, that was one of the things I really struggled with was was coming out of that kind of community feel and being part of something yeah that now I'm just me in a new town I know nobody apart from my husband and his family and that's it so yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah that's interesting isn't it and that and that's that's quite rugby league isn't it and I think kind of throughout yeah. the generations of playing rugby league it's like you've gone from you know kind of um you know the the miners and the the dockers and um the mill mm -hmm. workers literally walking past your house on the way to the stadium and you know going walking with yeah. the fans and then having a drink afterwards because it's just that's what that Perhaps. community yeah. is yeah and I think yeah. there's something really special about that that kind yeah, of that is that is rugby league isn't it um yeah. but and uh, I think that'll be what will help it will grow and that'll definitely help the women's side grow more and more yeah so. I think so I think so and actually I was watching a, an interview with um Lindsay Anfield do you know where so she no, not um she uh coaches uh Cass women now yeah. um but she's also a PE teacher and uh, she was talking about um uh one of the girls coming in and saying that she'd been to watch Cass Tigers uh at the weekend and she just assumed it was the men and she said oh who's your favorite player and she said oh so and so and a woman and she was like delighted that yeah she'd just gone to see the women there was no you know it was just like that's what I did I went to see the women you know and that's that's yeah. hopefully yeah hopefully that'll grow and it's like but it is thanks to people like you that did that and you know it is pioneering and, and I hope so so this um the project will kind of culminate in an exhibition as well so you'll all have to come and George and Emily will have to yeah. come and you, do you know what I mean and it's like you'll be you yeah. know and and because uh, you know it's it's amazing what you've done and to hear about it from you know from you is I've loved it thank you yeah, just thank it's you. been great to, to listen to um